matters, <laughs> right? Uh, and then we have David Nevins, who I've known since, uh, wow, for maybe 2003. And uh, he knew me when many of you do know who've been on Culture Class. I used to do this for one person who is a Academy Award and Emmy Award and Golden Globe Award and author Brian Grazer, spiky hair guy. Um, and David was the head of TV and uh, amazing. He won Emmy for Arrested Development. And uh, he would come by my office because he's even more curious than Brian. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he would come to my <laughs> office and he would always ask, what's up? What's new? What's up? What's new? So he and I have been friends and business colleagues since then. And uh, I love his curiosity. And we're going to learn from you uh, in a bit as well. I'm there. So David, tell us about, you have a long, exciting, successful career. You started as a network executive. Uh, you went to uh, uh, Imagine to be a TV producer, and now you're back in the network business. You're the CEO and chairman, you have a lot of titles, CEO and chairman of Showtime, which you completely reconstituted in a very successful way and interesting and like, you, you have uh, billions and uh, what's the one uh, with the terrorism and the schizophrenia? Homeland. Homeland's amazing. Yeah. Uh, and now that Viacom and CBS merged, right, you are now the chief creative officer of CBS. So what's going on? I mean, without, you know, I understand yeah. everybody has confidentiality, but what's, your, what's going on? No, look, Not only in the business, but also in the company. Well, it's a big, uh, I have a complicated job. I may actually have two jobs. Yeah. So Showtime is- Just like Ron. <laughs> right, right. I have two jobs. I, I, I'm a Broadway producer and I also have my own supplement line. <laughs> I'm going head to head with Ron. <laughs> no, um, I, uh, you know, I have, I have Showtime over here where I sort of have full, in the CEO, I have full business control. And then on the CBS side, there's, there's um, I also um, help program the network, help program the originals on all access. So everyone knows you, you put on your list is a, um, um, is, is one of the others. All access will event, you know, in the very near future will be uh, rebranding itself. And it's going to become sort of a super service for, um, you know, CBS, and Nickelodeon and Comedy Central and MTV, it'll continue to be the home of, of Trek, but it, it, there's, there's, uh, um, it's gonna become, I think a much bigger service with a lot more content. Also, you mentioned women's soccer. Uh, All Access is actually the home of women's soccer. So the, uh, the NWSL is now on, is on All Access. UEFA is on All Access, it'll have NFL games. So there's, there's gonna be a lot of pieces to it. Um, so I have a lot of different jobs and I also kind of help coordinate all the content across the country. We have a sort of, as, as CBS and Viacom have come together, uh, Viacom is, is fundamentally made up of all the Viacom uh, cable channels and those brands of MTV, Nickelodeon, VH1, uh, Pop, um, it's, par it, it's Paramount Pictures. And now you bring CBS and Showtime and Simon and Schuster into it. That essentially constitutes the, the media conglomerate that is Viacom CBS. Um, so part of my job is making sure there's coordination between all these different content factories. Um, and that's going really well. Um, you know, I think uh, we're now six months into this new merged company, uh, a little more than six months, maybe closer to nine. Um, and it's really starting to uh, operate well. Um, uh, what a what a time to yeah it's so it's been wild and fascinating and, and so one of the things that you were talking about which I think you know I can talk about the whole thing but it's just it's too big and complicated a company let's talk about Viacom CBS and streaming as you talk about the Netflixification of the world we'll so, change that. <laughs> what change it to the streamification how's that yeah I prefer the streamification because you know. <laughs> The truth is we've been in it, you know, via both, both All Access and Showtime have been in the game for more than five years now. And uh, um, 
you know, I, I, this is something I can't announce what exactly our subs are, uh, because that's, we're, you know, we're about to an announce our uh, second quarter results. But let's suffice it to say it's going very well. And I think we have a lot more already subs than people realize. And this is before the relaunch of, uh, of, of all access. When but is our that, strategy, we when basically is that have when is that going to happen? Do we know yet, or can you say? No, I have, we haven't announced it. But anyway, it's. it's but I it's think this that's year. a good thing because it's like this year, there's going to be a uh, um, kind of a soft launch. It's going to put a lot of the material from the other uh, um, from Nickelodeon and uh, MTV, VH1, all those companies are going to. That's going to be within the next uh, month or so, and then and then there'll be a. a a hard launch thereafter with can i just say one thing i think that's actually really good for you because you know you see the other ones that are struggling right now because they don't right. have the content and right. you kind of, and you're also like the big hurrah at the end you know so right and we're not um we're not one and the point is that we're not launching from zero we're launching right. from already you know uh tens of millions so we're it's it's going very well and Showtime. So I was, I was just going to lay out the strategy, very the, the clean brief of how do we, how are we approaching the streaming world, which is basically it's three three legs of the stool. One is Pluto, which is free. Uh, you can get it anywhere you, you want. It's it's free. It's advertising video on demand. Uh, Showtime is the premium uh, uh, part of it, and Showtime is going to stay Showtime as HBO becomes. HBO Max and goes more mainstream. I think it's an opportunity for Showtime to stay the pure play, uh, premium, R-rated, adult, however you want to say it, you know, sophisticated um, alternative. And then the what's what's currently CBS All Access, which will be uh, renamed, given a slightly broader name, will become the repository for the mainstream, uh, and be, you know that will also be a subscription service. So it's three legs of the stool. But even just Showtime, um, I will say we, we've put on more subs in the last six months than we had in the previous 30 months. So it is significantly accelerating. And, uh, um, and a part of it was happening before COVID, like, um, you know, starting December, we really finally got like the content flywheel happening. And you know, generally on Showtime on a weekly basis, you would see, you know, two shows and, you know, it's Homeland and uh, Homeland and Ray Donovan are on at the same time. Uh, you know, it's kind of two shows, but finally, in the, by the by the end of the year last year, we had three major shows. It was Shameless, Ray Donovan, The L Word, uh, the new version of The L Word, and in addition to all the movies and smaller series and nonfiction and the circus and all that stuff. So it all started working together. And it, we, you know, it's very related. Amount of content drives usage, usage drives longer lifetime value. So that already started to accelerate November, December of last year. This first quarter this year was our best quarter ever. And then the second quarter, which is really the COVID period. When I, I'm talking about quarters, I'm talking, you know, the first quarter is uh, January through March and just looking at different periods. So that's that was pre-COVID. And then March through June, or uh, April through June is kind of like prime first wave, as you said, the first act of COVID. We're now in the second act of COVID, but it has, it has taken off. And a lot of it is just having the right content at the right time. We made a significant investment last year. Um, and it's laid out very nicely with these sort of tent pole shows driving, um, driving subscribers. And, uh, you know, even a show like The Shy, which is in its third season, which is on right now, which is about sort of African-American life in the south side of Chicago. And it's, it's kind of a celebration. It's from Lena Waithe. Um, it's got tough stuff, but it's not, you know, I think it's more, it's much more upbeat than, you know, say the wire or something. It's not fundamentally crime law and order based, you know, it's about, it's about people living their lives. And so it's, it was kind of like the right show to have at this moment of racial reckoning. And so that show has doubled its, you know, it's, it's, okay. it's business over, over two seasons. So like, that's now a temple show and it's just been an interesting moment. So, 
you know, in the big picture in the media, um, you know, the live business has been hurt and we're all like, I could not be rooting any harder for, for Ron and everybody, you know, the world needs Broadway back. You know, I have no fear of the, you know, long-term repercussions that, you know, the hunger is there, the demand is not going to go away, but it sucks for people in the theater and that's producers and actors and technicians and everybody. It sucks for people in the theater and that, and the same story in the theater is happening, you know, live performance, all, all, the, all the sort of live, which is the, you and know, sports, right? Which in is sports. A, yeah. yeah. I mean, and that's the guts. That's the guts of entertainment is, is a live experience. And we're figuring out ways to reconstitute a live experience, but we're all really hungry for live experience back. But, and what about production? What do you think, what, what's the roadmap? So production, we're, we're in the midst of it right now. There are some things coming back. We're about to start making Big Brother again. You know, that's the ultimate contained environment of a show. It's not um, going to get but, COVID. That's, that's right. <laughs> um, so things are starting to come back. Reality shows will be first. Um, we're in deep in conversations with all the unions. There's four unions that are deep in conversations with the producers right now. It's the IA that represents most of the crew, Teamsters that represent uh, mostly drivers, SAG represents actors, and DGA that represents uh, directors and production managers. And so it's sort of what Ron said. Um, and everyone's trying to figure it out together. I think we're, you know, sooner or later, we're going to get, we're going to figure out what the protocol is. I think there's general agreement on what the testing protocol is going to be. Um, so I'm hoping we're going to get back into big scale production, you know, September, October. Are um, you going, are you going internationally to do some things where it might be? We are. I mean, we're already very international. So we have a production of Halo that is, um, was interrupted. It was in the middle of production in Budapest and we're desperately trying to get into Budapest. So it's, it's complicated because there's unions, there's governments. We're negotiating with the, uh, with the government of Hungary, uh, which is, has challenges, uh, in Canada. Um, the Canadian government doesn't necessarily want to agree to what SAG wants. It's the Canadian uh -huh. government, they're being, the way it works in Canada is the government controls who gets tested and they, they make priorities. So, you know, it looks like the, the, the gist of our agreement with SAG and with the unions is going to be once a week for everybody and three times a week for what's considered zone A, which are the actors and the people right around the camera. Um, and, uh, but the Canadian government is like, uh, we don't think film people are so much more important than everybody else. So we're not necessarily going to agree to that. So there's a little tension there between an, a American labor union and a Canadian, the Canadian yeah. government. So anyway, it's, it's, been, for, it's those, been, for those of you who don't know, SAG is the Screen Actors Guild, the guild for actors. Another thing I want to say, it's interesting in terms of your strategy, in terms of having these tent pole to bring you in. Because I would say that's a success at Disney Plus with The Mandalorian or Hamilton, whereas uh, HBO Max, you know, they really, or Peacock, they're really relying on everything they have that's not really tenpole. So that's a cool strategy. I want to so show It doesn't, you know, that may drive a lot of usage, but you're probably not going to sign up because, oh, they have friends, like, uh, uh -huh. you know. But uh, they don't. You've seen friends. You've seen friends You'll watch Friends if it's there. You like Friends, but you know, is that really going to convince you to sign up and fork over fifteen dollars a month? And so, the, you know, but they have—it's a long game. And you know, when they get back into production, they'll have some tentpole programming. All right. So let's shift to let's shift to uh, creativity because you're you are creative. Yeah, let's talk about creativity. Much more interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Business. Whatever. You're talking to the wrong guy, by the way. But I'll. Uh, what are you talking about? I've been with you for so you're the, that, and that's why I'm so surprised. Well, you're, aren't you the chief creative officer? So yeah, uh, I'm, and I'm, so uh, it seems like you're more creative in terms of like what's the new type of leadership now, and of course you're you're focusing on ending systemic racism as well. Like okay, it's exciting, but it probably is like the most challenging time in your life as a leader. By the way, do you have a hard stop at three o'clock? If you do, it's fine. No, I can go. I can go another fifteen twenty cool. minutes. Night guide culture class after hours. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get going. You can ask questions for me and Ron together. I think we're gonna be more. Okay, well, that's good. before we, I do have a question for you and Ron, uh, but I also want to ask you this about your creative process and you know creativity in a time of COVID. 
you know, what, so you, we showed the mannequin and the, you know, like, how are we going to see sex? Scene? Well, I don't even know how I mean, to date, let alone. <laughs> yeah, the people are figuring figure. out how to date, Brad, and you're going to figure out how to date. I mean, there's nothing like a little hardship um, to change your processes. Uh, so maybe your dating processes could use a little change. That wouldn't be the best, you know, so uh, <laughs> the good thing. So I, I, love, I love that Lawrence Wright article about the, the Black Plague, because I do think like, good i know for a fact that good stuff is going to come out of this and you know uh i hope for ron's sake that there's you know there's great playwrights writing right now and oh. and there's going to be interesting shit happening and it's going to make you know our our creative cultural lives more interesting hereafter so i don't know at all exactly how it's going to work yet but uh um you know i like to say about my job is i'm um not an athlete, but I'm an athletic supporter. <laughs> so like, you know, and same thing, like, I think, you know, the, the, my value add to the system and probably like Ron, although he seems like he works on both sides, both as a producer and as a writer and actor, but, uh, you know, is to get, get the best out of people and push people to do their best work. And uh, that's uh, a leader today. That's a leader today. But also yeah. you saw my, you know, slide on the workplace now. I mean, there are a lot of sure there's furloughs and, uh, you know, layoffs at your company and, you know, the mood isn't really so high right now on all these different levels. You know, they have to figure out how to send their kids back to school or not to school. So, you know, what do you do as a leader to inspire today? Well, there's an excess of communication in a good way. Like, uh, I, I feel more in touch with what's happening in my, because, because of Zoom is, is a very way to, for, for efficient, uh, communication with people. So that's helpful. Oh. I think try to be honest about what's happening. There's been, you know, wave after wave of, you know, tough stuff, you know, the political situation, the comp in the, in the country is tough. And then there is tough. Um, there's, you know, the economy isn't great. Uh, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's a reason why, uh, George Floyd hit with a ton of bricks, heavier than uh, than a lot of other um, you know cop killings um, that came before it because of where we're sitting right now and how we're talking to each other. So you just you know I. I but it's also I keep I saying that by being direct. You know let's let's you know let's 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 not dance around. Uh, Let's yeah, I keep saying it, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna shift to you and Ron, uh, but I keep saying my whole theme is that COVID has been a magnifier of all the shit yeah. that we've our world before, and now an accelerator to the change. It's an accelerant. It's been yeah. an absolute accelerant for a lot of trends that are already uh, happening, and, and and I think it'll be an accelerant for change. Uh, for good. All right, Ron, you wanted to ask David a question. Yeah, David. Oh, hold on, my own. Because you have to, you have to leave it there, right? I have to leave shortly. I don't have to be on the next Zoom at three, but some. Yeah, David, I can't believe you like Zoom. It's like exhausting, but it's good today. I mean, I don't love it. I would. <laughs> I'm dying. I'm one of the people. I'm one of the thirty percent that's dying to get back in the office. We we we've done studies, and it looks like twenty or thirty percent want to go home, go back, and you know, seventy percent are like, oh, I'm not ready. I, I am in the twenty or thirty percent that is like dying to do it. And you do it even with the safety precautions and all that. Like, or the yeah, but, on the, but you know, my company is not allowing it. It's not, it's not a choice right now. Uh, I think wisely, because they shouldn't listen to me about everything. Um, so <laughs> You're the creative officer. You're yeah. not the CEO I'm not officer. The safety officer. <laughs> I, listen, I listen to the safety officers. Sorry, Ron, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say, they, you know, because especially in this anti-racism culture that we're in now and the number of folks who are now woke, um, there in the article you'll see if you haven't seen it that there are a number of uh, black content that's being created and has already been created and I think um, we should see if we can collaborate to cross pollinate between the good work that we're doing here on Broadway and the good work you're doing on television because I'm working with someone who is from Hollywood and we're going to turn that property into a musical I would love to be able to see are there properties that we can also bring to Hollywood that would make good content for your viewers. 
Yeah, I mean, without a doubt. Um, and uh, yeah, first of all, I'd love to. Sec love to do it specifically with you. But second of all, um, you know, do I get a uh, cut? Peter, uh, you know, uh, there's there's so much going on uh, that every day. I mean, literally the me the meeting I was on beforehand, which was a rare actual creative meeting for me, um, where it, we've been we're working on an adaptation of the great Swedish movie Let the Right One In, um, and the, the by the way, the guy who the writer who I was working with is actually a you know a, a um, uh, is a playwright comes out of Broadway, Andrew Hinderacker, Hinderacker, and uh, um, just so yeah, of course. I mean, you you have incredible access to writing talent, um, and also uh, you know um, lots of incredible properties that I think would work great on television. So I already and looked at it as Broadway is a huge source. I completely agree, and I, you know it's already started cross pollinating in that. A number of the playwrights that I know, like um, so who wrote Proud, she wrote The Shameless, and she's now working on yeah. other shows. So the writing, there's a connectivity. Um, but I think in terms of productions, there's a real rich, fertile ground that, that we can uh, leverage and take advantage of. Yeah. Well, I have a question. Are you thinking of doing it like, you know, I called it the Hamiltonian effect. Is it going to be like that? Or are you thinking of doing it more in terms of like, what they did with Les Miserables at some point. Like, how, how are you thinking about it, about translating broadly? You asking me or Iran? You, actually, the, the buyer. Well, Wait, like what you're interested in. My, I mean, I'm, I'm, there are the rare ones that are a one-off, like, event, like Hamilton. Uh, um, but in general, I don't, I don't think that's, I mean, there's going to be some of that, and especially in the, uh, in the confined environment that we are now, Broadway is a good sort of confined uh, process, so I think you can do it. But in in general, you know, I think you got to create, you know, this you got to create the tell the story, but for the for the medium. And I don't think theater is necessarily the best medium for uh, for television. But you know, it, yes, it can be. But I think I don't know. I, I'm, I'm in the long run. I think it's going to be about taking great theater, great stories, uh, great concepts, and then adapting them for television. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, both of you, um, if we're gonna be spending more money, like you were saying with the, the uh, guild that might require more money for safety, right? And Ron, you were telling me about, you know, cleaning the theaters and having thermometers before, you know, are prices gonna go up for everybody in terms of that? What does that mean? Well, I, I know. I, we're between a rock and a hard place there, right? Because so many people have had a, such a major reduction in you know, their income that they don't have the same disposable income. Now, there may be some part of the strata that is not as price sensitive than others, um, but we're hoping that we will be able to work with the unions as you know, at, at, that are mentioned by David that overlap to a degree and making sure that we have deliver a product lean with as little overhead so that we can have a lower weekly nut because we don't know that if people are going to still want to pay you know 250 dollars or 175 dollars to see i this paid guy. 500 for a too proud <laughs> hit now come on now brad i can't look you there when you got a big hit you got a big hit but uh <laughs> but i'm hoping that we will uh be able to find a nice medium right where it's, it's it, it, we can still attract the people who we want to attract who are our loyal fans um, and also attract the people who have been sitting in their homes who may not always go to Broadway theaters to see a show. So right. it's a very, it, it's a minefield <laughs> that we're traversing. We'll talk about it. I'm so much smarter though about, about pricing and stratification and meeting demand. Uh, they'll, they'll figure this one out too. Um, you guys will figure this out and, you know, can't charge more than people can afford, but you got to find, find that sweet spot. And so I think there's going to be, there'll be a premium on smaller shows coming back, right? You know, at least initially, I, yeah. I presume. You know, in Broadway, 70% of our market is, is tourism. So I don't expect that people will be rushing onto planes, trains, and automobiles to come to New York immediately. 
um, which is why I said I think the New York area is going to be there. But to, to your point, David, we do have dynamic ticket pricing, so you know we can we can bend to make sure that we have our homes houses filled, with, you know, with uh, audience members. So that's exciting. Yeah, I just wanted before if we continue, that'd be great with questions or if you have to run. Just next week is our second to last culture class of the summer semester. And uh, here's an interesting guy, Matt Seiler, who used to be uh, the CEO of IPG Media Brands, which is one of the big advertising holding companies. And he pivoted to go into marketing employees um, and executives of how to redefine themselves, not in terms of what they do for a living, like a development executive, a marketing executive, a human resources executive, a tech person. It's more about marketing yourself for a job in terms of who you are, your main. So I would be Mr. Curiosity. We need a curiosity, right? we need a teacher, right? Uh, David, we need a, a, a creative person. Ron, we need somebody who could do a gazillion different jobs. And so he has a really interesting way of like uh, shaping your career in the future. And it's all about marketing yourself. And then we're going to have Dr. Tiffany Jana. And she's really cool. She lives um, in Richmond. And uh, she wrote a book called Overcoming Bias. And that's our second to last one. Uh, we'll be on COVID number 20. And then the week after, uh, there's a very special uh, opening, which I don't want to tell anybody with. And then it's going to be of just me zeitgeiting guiding uh, the entire time in the four big buckets, basically what I do for clients and what I do for my premium offering. And then uh, we'll figure it out what we're going to do for the fall. So thank you to everybody who's been here uh, with us. Uh, Ron and David, uh, you know, if you have to go, great. I'm, I'm blessed that you're here. Uh, I want to make sure and tell us all where we could uh, sign up for CBS All Access. That would be great. Um, CBSAllAccess.com. That's easy. All right, great. And then, Ron, uh, if somebody wants to buy some products from you, how would they reach you? Or oh, I, uh, I put my health uh, information in the chat. So if you want to click on that, it'll take you right to my portal. And um, also, if I don't know who's on the call, but you know, I'm always all looking for people who are interested in telling the untold story of underrepresented communities. So if you want to invest or produce in Broadway, the doors are open. I want more women, more people of color, but more importantly, I want people with a conscience, people who want to mo do more than just make a ton of money. And that's what we need to do to reboot humanity. Our world was disrupted by technology, then it's been disrupted by COVID. And now the only way to reconstitute a, an amazing future that we all want to live in, back to the theme of the cultural renaissance, we got to focus on humanity now. That's the I agree. Oh, and to that point, there is a, doc a documentary that actually my co-producer here is on the line, uh, Christine, uh, called Viva Verdi, which is a heartwarming story about the seniors who retired to in Milan uh, into the home of of Casa Verdi, which was set up by Giuseppe Verdi, uh, the opera writer, and it's really going to be beautiful. So keep an eye out, keep an ear open. Double V's, Viva Verdi. Okay. And the last thing I'll say is I always have to pitch at the end. We've been doing this uh, out of the bottom of our, in our entire hearts and minds. Uh, you know, if you can make a contribution for all the people who help us here, insightguide.com, thank you. You'll see all the people who are here for the summer semester. And uh, yeah, we got two more. I hope everybody, you know, this is act two still. Um, you know, if you do have Zoom fatigue or whatever, it's time to, you know, look at nature and think about act three because it's gonna be challenging for all of us, but I believe in all of us. And uh, thank you for participating in culture class and I'll see you next week. Great, thank you, Brad. Thank you so much. Be in touch. Bye.